All right, hey everyone. So um, this is going to be a series of lab reviews. Um, this is just going to take us through a couple of digital images where I'll try to point out some of the structures that you are going to be asked to identify that are associated with each lab. Um, so this resource is coming from the Scrubs team, so Student Collaborative Resources for Understanding and Brody Success, and this is going to be the Neuro Lab component. All right, so once again, a mission statement for Scrubs. Uh, Scrubs is a student-driven initiative that aims to develop resources for current cohorts that are and future cohorts that are going to pass through Brody. The idea is that we will participate on a couple of different committees that work to develop resources, and then the idea is to hope create resources that we wish we would have had while we were in the course. And that means that these resources will be specific to the Brody curriculum. So if this is a mission that aligns with some of your goals, we would love to have everyone that is willing to join the uh, Scrubs team with our different components and be a part of one of the teams. So with that said, I'm going to move on to the disclaimer. So just again, a disclaimer, this is pretty standard for all of our resources. Um, just want to Make, point this out that the resources are supplemental. They are made by the students, not the faculty. So there could be errors in our development. Um, we try to limit this through multiple stages of vetting. But if there's a contraindication with the coursework, please go with the um, stuff that's delivered in your course. That also applies because the courses are going to inevitably change over time. So some of this information may not apply um, year after year, which is why this development for these teams is going to consist um, of development each and every year, even once resources have been made. So use these resources as a supplement, but not as a primary resource for your course material. All right, and with that said, we're going to go ahead and start doing some of the identification. So within the neuro lab, um, when you're studying for your neuro practicals, it is important to remember that you still do need to know some of your anatomy of the skull. So this is going to be a quick overview, but let's first start with the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. So the cribriform plate is located anteriorly in the skull, and the cribriform plate is where you're going to have your olfactory bulbs sitting on top of. Um, so this is cranial nerve one. So the olfactory bulbs sit right on top. And one of the things I want to go ahead and point out is when we're learning the bones of the skull, one of the reasons that this is important is because you can get questions um, that kind of have to do with head injury. And you have to know where are the bony landmarks in the skull that could possibly injure the brain. So you can see that the cribriform plate here has a bunch of little holes and pockets. Well, that can allow you, that can cause tearing of cranial nerve one because it's kind of like a cheese grater, right? So if you have a head injury where your brain's moving back and forth against this structure, you could damage those olfactory bulbs. Okay, so that's the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. Now we go to the cristigalli, that's right here in the front. Again, these landmarks are going to be more important as you move forward in the class, but the cristigalli is going to be one of your attachment points for your fox cerebri, so it's really important to know where that landmark is in the skull. The anterior clonoid processes, so the anterior clonoid processes are located right here. You have posterior clonoid processes located more posteriorly. These um, clonoids, so the anterior clonoids, which there are two of, and two posterior clonoids, these are going to form a saddle, which is the Turkish saddle, also known as the, uh, let's find it, dorsum cella. So the dorsum cella is located right here. This is going to be where your pineal gland is housed. Sorry, pituitary. Pituitary gland is going to be housed. So your pituitary sits in here and it's going to be protected on the corners by the clonoid processes. And those clonoid processes are going to be attachments for dura mater, which you'll learn in a later lab. Now going through some of the foramen, you have the foramen ovale located right here. This is an important foramen to know because this is where um, V3, part of that trigeminal nerve, is going to be exiting the brain. And that's going to do a lot of the sensation for your face. So that could be a possible region of injury if nerves are getting damaged as they're coming out of this hole, which would give a very specific presentation. All right, we're going to talk about the clivus real quick. The clivus is located down here below the dorsum cella kind of at the base of the skull. And the re really important thing you need to know about the clivus is if you damage the clivus, your brain stem sits right up against it. And your brain stem is going to be where you have most of your essential functions. So if you were to damage the clivus and it pushed back into the brain stem, that could be very detrimental. Um, you may end up with quadriplegia or some other kind of motor defects along with sensory defects.
petrous portion of the temporal bone. I just want to point this out here. The petrous portion of the temporal bone runs across the temporal bone, and it's going to, again, be important more so in a future um, lab as you're going to talk about your dura venous sinuses and your um, tentoriums, so are your dura mater and pia mater and things of that nature. So there are dural attachments that attach to the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which will allow you to have a sinus communication. Um, but again, that's something that will cover in a later lab. And then finally, the jugular, for, jugular foramen. The jugular foramen is located down here. It's what allows the sinuses to drain into the internal jugular vein. Um, and what's important about this is through this foramen, you're also going to get a couple more cranial nerves that come through. So if you think back to anatomy, this is going to be cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. So 9, 10, and 11 all exit through the jugular foramen to leave the skull. So if you have a blockage of the jugular foramen, maybe a neoplasm that's, uh, of the bone that's pushing into the jugular foramen and you're not allowing those nerves to communicate, that's going to present with damage to cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. All right, so now looking at a external view of the skull, or sorry, of the brain, we're just going to go over some things really quickly. Right in the middle here, you see that there's still some dura that's on top, but we can see that there's another layer of dura underneath, and that's going to allow kind of a vein-looking structure to run down the middle of the brain. This is going to be your superior sagittal sinus. Again, this is something that's going to be covered a little bit more later in, a, um, in the future labs, but I just want to go ahead and start pointing that out now. Now, this is made up of dura matter. The dura matter is the most um, superficial layer of the brain, and it would cover the entire brain as it sits in the skull, but it was removed during the resection of taking the brain out of the skull. And then the arachnoid granulations, I'm going to point those out here. They're located a little bit laterally. These arachnoid granulations are going to allow cerebrospinal fluid to be drained from the internal structures of the brain and drained into the superior sagittal sinus, and that's going to allow it to uh, kind of keep from building up within the brain. So one of the things that you'll learn about in class is that if you have meningitis, for instance, so inflammation of your meninges and infection, you could damage these arachnoid granulations, meaning cerebrospinal fluid is not able to get out of the internal structures of the brain, which can cause the brain to swell, which can be a really big problem. But again, the arachnoid granulations allow cerebrospinal fluid to drain out of the internal structures of the brain into the superior sagittal sinus. And in the next lab, you'll talk about where those sinuses are and what they communicate with. So now going over some of the topography of the brain, um, this is one of the biggest labs of the course, um, assuming that it stays the same in future um, courses. But this is a really important lab to get your foundation. I think if you spend a lot of time with this lab and you kind of got it down, then it's going to be really really helpful as you move throughout the course. So we're gonna start with your frontal lobe. So I'm gonna mark the borders of the frontal lobe. First, we have our longitudinal fissure that goes through the two hemispheres. So that's gonna be a big landmark that we're gonna use. And then secondly, we're going to see that we have right here a central sulcus. So the central sulcus is going to divide the frontal lobe, so everything up here in the front, from the parietal lobe. So there goes your central sulcus. The, I really like to use this as one of my primary landmarks when I'm looking at the brain, and that's because there's two gyri, which are the raised portions. So because I haven't mentioned this yet, a sulcus is the indentation, whereas a gyrus is kind of the bump that you can see. So you have a gyrus in the front and a gyrus in the back that come down vertically, and right in between is your central sulcus. So that's going to divide your frontal lobe from your parietal lobe. So with that in mind, if you're in the frontal lobe, you're going to see a gyrus that is coming down from the top of the head down towards the front, and it's going to be most superior. We are going to call this the superior frontal gyrus, so superior frontal gyrus coming down. We look beneath it, there's another gyrus. It's going in the same direction, coming down towards the front. We're going to call this the middle frontal gyrus, so superior middle. And wouldn't you know, if we go down one more, we're going to have an inferior frontal gyrus that's coming down. So you have superior, middle, inferior frontal gyruses. Now, a sulcus, again, is one of the indentations of the brain. The sulcus that separates the superior frontal gyrus from the middle frontal gyrus is the superior frontal sulcus. Okay, so that's located right there. If we go below the middle frontal gyrus, there's another sulcus. And this sulcus is separating the middle frontal gyrus from the inferior frontal gyrus. This is going to be the inferior frontal sulcus.
So we have a superior frontal sulcus and an inferior frontal sulcus, where we have superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyruses. Now, the inferior frontal gyrus is broken down into a couple different regions, which I'm going to actually go over in more detail on a future slide. We have an apercular, triangular, and orbital region. But just keep that in mind. We'll cover that on a slightly better view. Um, we went over the sulcus, and then we talked about the central sulcus coming through. That's going to be my posterior border of the frontal lobe. This gyrus that is in front of the central sulcus is going to be called my precentral gyrus. So the precentral gyrus is going to be my primary motor cortex. So this is my primary motor cortex, and that's going to be Brodmann area number four. So it's important that you start to putting together your Brodmann areas and your functions as you're starting to learn this topography or the different landmarks on the brain. They're going to come up again and again throughout the course. And then if there's a gyrus behind the central sulcus, so again, the central sulcus is right here. So if there's a gyrus behind the central sulcus, we're going to call that the postcentral gyrus, so posterior to the central sulcus. All right, so moving to a slightly more lateral view of the brain, really quick, we're going to go over the same landmarks that we used just a moment ago. So we have the front of the brain, back of the brain here. One of the ways I can tell this is the back of the brain is here is a bit of the cerebellum in the back. Another nice landmark is your temporal lobes are kind of oriented. Um, so there's a little gap here that tells me this is the front. But the biggest landmark that I use whenever I'm looking at the lateral portion of the brain and I want to know the names of the gyri is I look for this central sulcus. The reason for this is the central sulcus is pretty easy to determine once you've seen the brain a few times because of the gyri on either side. They're, they're coming vertically, so coming straight up and down. So with that in mind, we've got the frontal lobe. We start from the top. This is going to be my superior frontal gyrus. I go underneath to find the next gyrus. That is my mental, middle frontal gyrus. And then most inferiorly, my inferior frontal gyrus. And again, the sulci that separate the superior and middle frontal gyruses is going to be your superior frontal sulcus. The sulcus that separates the middle from the inferior, so it's kind of located right in here, that is going to be your inferior frontal sulcus. Now from this side view, we can see the different regions of your inferior frontal gyrus. That is the opercular, triangular, and orbital region. So here is your inferior frontal gyrus. And what I'm going to do, and this is how I identify these every single time, I look for the precentral gyrus, which is in front of the central sulcus, and I see that this is all part of the precentral gyrus. Okay, so I look what is right in front of the precentral gyrus. I'm going to say that's this region right here. That's part of my inferior frontal gyrus, but specifically this most posterior portion is going to be the opercular region. So the operculum or opercular region of the frontal, um, inferior frontal gyrus is going to sit over top of the insula, which was the more interior structure of the brain. Now, the opercular region is Brodmann's area number 44. If I move slightly more anteriorly, I have something that looks kind of like a triangle. It's a little outcrop, so a little bit like a triangle here, and that is going to be the triangular region. The triangular region is Brodmann area number 45. Brahmin area 44 and 45 combine together to form Broca's area. So Broca's area is how you have control of motor speech. So it's really important to know in the frontal lobe, Brahmin area 44, the opercular region, Brahmin area 45, the triangular region, both combine to form uh, Broca's area, which is going to give you control of motor speech. And then if I come a little bit more anteriorly, you think back to the skull, the brain is sitting right on top of the orbits. This is going to be the orbital region of my inferior frontal gyrus. Okay, now let's see what else we wanted to point out from this view. So let's talk about, we talked about our central sulcus, helping to delineate the frontal from the parietal lobe. If I look back, we have our postcentral gyrus, and the sulcus directly behind that is going to be my post central gyrus. So post-central sulcus, post-central gyrus directly behind. All right. Now the lateral fissure, is this is the lateral fissure of Sylvius. It's going to separate the temporal lobe from all the other structures. So it's coming right through here. This is a really nice um, fissure. It's kind of in association with our longitudinal fissure on the top. It's a really easy fissure to find on all the brains. So I use that as a landmark pretty often as well.
All right. So while we're in this view, let's talk about some of the temporal gyroses. So just like the frontal lobe, you, you're going to have a superior, middle, and inferior uh, temporal gyrus. So let's start at the top, superior, coming down, middle, directly below that, and then inferior, all the way on the bottom. Now, just like in the frontal lobe, where you had a superior frontal sulcus and an inferior frontal sulcus separating these gyruses, you're going to have the same thing on the bottom. So you have a superior temporal gyre, or sorry, superior temporal sulcus, right through here, and then below that you're going to have an inferior temporal sulcus. Right. And now some of the things in the parietal lobe, again the next view should be a little bit more clear to see this as we're going to turn a little bit more laterally. I'm going to just start pointing some of those out here. You are going to have a in between, the, so the parietal lobe is split up into two lobules. You have a superior lobule and an inferior lobule. That is split by this sulcus here which is the interparietal sulcus. So that splits the superior region from the inferior region. Now, as I'm following the t uh, lateral fissure of sylvius posteriorly, I'm going to see that there's kind of a region that's associated with it. So I follow it back and it kind of wraps around at an angle. So this part that wraps around at an angle in association with my lateral fissure is the angular gyrus, which is part of your inferior parietal lobule, which is this region here. So the angular gyrus is located at the back of your lateral fissure. So you see the lateral fissure coming up and look at this angular gyrus coming around. Now, if we go to the slightly more anterior region, that's slightly more anterior to the angular gyrus, think for a second, what are we gonna call this? All right, and I say that because I've now forgotten off the top of my head. It is the supramarginal gyrus. So the supramarginal gyrus is anterior to the angular gyrus. So this is going to be Brobman's area 39, that's your angular gyrus, Brobman area 40, your supramarginal gyrus. So 39 and 40 are going to come together to form Wernicke's area, along with a little bit of 22, which is part of your superior temporal gyrus. So this area right here, Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is going to allow you to understand speech. So Broca's area up here in the front, 44, 45, is how you speak, the motor component, how you understand speech, written and spoken, is going to be Wernicke's area. 39, 40, and a little bit of 22. Now, I do want to point out, 39, the angular gyrus, is going to be written speech, whereas the supramarginal gyrus is going to be spoken speech language. Now, the, what I want to point out here is the way that I remember this, supermarginal starts with an S for spoken language. Okay, Angular gyrus right behind it is going to be for written language. Another thing I want to point out here is the um, premotor cortex. So the premotor cortex, if we follow the arrow, that is going to be located right in this region. So how you identify this is you find the precentral sulcus. So that's going to be in front of the precentral gyrus. So coming down, there's your precentral sulcus. I followed it all the way around. So I find that and I find where does it intersect with my superior frontal sulcus. So there's the superior frontal sulcus. There's the precentral sulcus. I find where those intersect, which is right here. And that is going to be the rough area of your premotor cortex. So it includes a little bit of the gyri here as long, along with the sulci. And that is going to be Brahma's area number six. So this goes into motor planning. So premotor cortex, primary motor cortex, Broca's area, and then Wernicke's area. Now we're moving to a mid-sagittal view here. So we're going to go over some quick structures and we'll come back to this view in a little bit zoomed in um, in a minute. But we're going to start with the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is a structure that allows you to communicate between the two hemispheres of the brain. And this is one of the big landmarks that you're going to be looking for when you get a mid-sagittal view such as this. So the corpus callosum here. Now the corpus callosum is going to have four different components. We're going to start most anteriorly and closest to the nose. This is going to be the rostrum. So this is the rostrum of the corpus callosum. As you start to make the turn, this is going to be called the genu. So the genu is the turn of the corpus callosum. The remainder of this superior region is called the body. Okay, so the body is what is being highlighted now. 
And then if I go posteriorly and you see where it widens, that is going to be called the splenium. So the four different regions of the corpus callosum are the rostrum, the genu, the body, and the splenium. Now, there is a gyrus directly above the corpus callosum. So here's the gyrus. It is directly above the corpus callosum. It wraps all the way around. This is going to be your cingulate gyrus. Okay, so your cingulate gyrus is directly above the corpus callosum. Now, if you look, you're going to see a sulcus right here. This was the same sulcus that you saw in the previous view that marked the precentral sulcus. So that means everything in this anterior region is part of your superior frontal gyrus. But this is your precentral sulcus that's continuing into the, um, the mid-sagittal view. That means that right here is where you had your precentral gyrus and postcentral gyrus. And together, these are going to be called your paracentral lobule. So that may, the anterior region is the continuation of your precentral gyrus. The posterior region is your postcentral gyrus, continuing on the mid-sagittal view. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here. Now, one thing I want to point out, and we'll point this out from an inferior view later, but right here is part of the, this is the most medial, inferior portion of the frontal lobe. That is going to be your gyrus rectus. And we'll go into how that looks from an inferior view, but I do want to point out that you can see it from a mid-sagittal view. All right, now, underneath the corpus callosum, there is a thin membrane that connects the corpus callosum from the fornix, which is being highlighted now. The thin membrane, which is this structure here, is called the septum pellucidum. That is a big landmark that you're gonna see when we do coronal cross sections. So you find the corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, and that will connect to the superior portion of your fornix. All right, now, going through some of these sulci in this frontal portion of the uh, mid-sagittal view, directly on top of the corpus callosum, so separating the corpus callosum from the cingulate gyrus above it, that is going to be your colossal sulcus. Okay, so beside the um, corpus callosum, you have the colossal sulcus. Above the cingulate gyrus, so cingulate gyrus being highlighted now, if I go superior to that, I am going to find another sulcus. This is going to be your cingulate sulcus. So cingulate sulcus coming all the way around. All right, so I'm gonna highlight that one more time, coming to the back and then around, cingulate sulcus. Now, you say, Ryan, there's a weird, weird little upturn that happens here, and I'm gonna say you're correct. That is the marginal branch of your cingulate sulcus. So the cingulate sulcus really is coming around towards the back, but there is a branch that comes up and that is called the marginal branch. That marginal branch is going to mark the posterior border of your paracentral lobule. And again, the paracentral lobule is located here. The paracentral lobule is the median component that was your precentral sulcus and your postcentral, or sorry, precentral gyrus and your postcentral gyrus. All right. With that said, we're going to continue um, to our next one and we'll come back and look at a more zoomed in view and look at some of the more posterior structures. All right, so looking from this view, we're, we've gone a little bit more posterior. So here's the anterior portion of the brain. Here's the posterior portion of the brain and there is my cerebellum. Okay, I'm going to find my central sulcus once again to help delineate the frontal lobe. That's perfect. And now I want to start to figure out, while we're in this view, so a few more of these structures that are in the frontal region of the brain. So let's start in front of my precentral sulcus, or precentral gyrus, sorry. There is in the inferior frontal gyrus, it is broken into three regions. And I can see that this most posterior region, right, right in front of my precentral gyrus, is going to be the operculum, triangular orbital. I know we've hit this a few times. So now moving forward, we are going to look at the lateral fissure. Again, the lateral fissure of Sylvius, we follow it back. We can see that it continues up, but there is a section of brain that is surrounding that upturn. That is your angular gyrus. Okay, angular gyrus, province area 39. We come more anterior, not part of my postcentral gyrus, which is coming down, but this region here is your supermarginal gyrus. Supermarginal gyrus, province area 40, S for spoken language. So that's how you understand spoken language. The superior parietal lobule, 
right? Again, it's, it was, it's easier to see on this view, but there is a sulcus that separates the superior and inferior parietal lobules. And that's the sulcus there. That is your interparietal sulcus. So interparietal sulcus there. Now you say, Ryan, how do I tell the difference between the parietal lobule or parietal lobe and the occipital lobe? And I said, okay, we're going to look for the parietal occipital sulcus. So a sulcus separating the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. So that's going to be right here. So parietal occipital sulcus at the back of the parietal lobe and at the anterior region of your occipital lobe. Parietal occipital sulcus. That separates the parietal lobe and the occipital lobe. Now, what about separating the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe? Well, here's your temporal lobe, which we've covered. I follow it back and there's a notch. So it looks like a sulcus. It's pretty much the same thing. It's going to continue up as your parieto occipital sulcus. But down here, separating the temporal lobe, we're going to call it the preoccipital notch. So the preoccipital notch separates the temporal lobe from your occipital lobe more posteriorly. Now, this is going to be a pretty high yield um, image to be familiar with. If you have removed the lateral portion of the brain, you can now see the superior temporal gyrus from a, um, and see its continuations as it's going into the insula, which is that little region in here. What's most important about this view is that you can see that there are some transverse gyruses that come off of the superior temporal gyrus. These are the transverse gyri of Heschel. Okay, the transverse gyri of Heschel. This is going to be Brahmin area 41 and 42. Together, these gyruses are going to be the region that you're going to have your primary auditory cortex. So hearing, this is where you're going to be able to hear your primary auditory cortex in a transverse gyre of Heschel, which you can only really appreciate once you've done this dissection and can see deeper in. That's not the only thing that I want to point out here, though. If you look at the most posterior portion of your superior temporal gyrus from this more medial view, this is going to be your planum temporale. So transverse gyre of Heschel, follow the superior temporal gyrus posteriorly. This is your planum temporale. All right, now an inferior view. Now this is something that often gets neglected to be looked at in lab, but this is a view that can be pretty commonly asked. So we're going to start with our frontal lobes and we're going to, and then we'll hit some of the other structures. So, so starting with our frontal lobe, the most median aspect of the frontal lobe from an inferior view is your gyrus rectus. You see that kind of goes straight up, which is why it gets this name. So gyrus rectus. What's really nice about this is I can delineate the gyrus rectus from the, um, the next gyrus over, which is going to be your medial orbital gyrus, because you're going to have the olfactory tract. So here goes your olfactory tract, and there are the bulbs right in the front. So olfactory bulbs, olfactory tract. And guess what the name of the sulcus is directly beneath? You got it, the olfactory sulcus. Okay, so it makes it nice and easy. That olfactory tract is a really nice delineator for your gyrus rectus and your medial orbital gyrus, which is going to be located more laterally. And then the most lateral portion over here is going to be your lateral orbital gyrus. Okay, so lateral orbital gyrus, medial orbital gyrus, gyrus rectus. Gyrus rectus is divided from the medial orbital gyrus via the um, olfactory sulcus, which has the olfactory tract and olfactory bulbs associated with it. Now, one thing that I want to point out, it's really difficult to see on this view, but if we were to zoom in, I want to say that the olfactory tract is going to continue posteriorly, and then it's going to bifurcate. There's going to be a division that comes more medially and a division that comes more laterally, which you won't talk about too much until you get to the last um, unit of this course. But right here, at the bifurcation point, that is where you're going to have your anterior perforating substance. So your anterior perforating substance is where vessels are going, small vessels are going to supply deep regions of the brain. And that is happening right at the bifurcation of your uh, olfactory tract. So that takes us through the frontal lobe. I now want to hit on the temporal lobe. So on the temporal lobe, over here is where we had the continuation of our inferior temporal gyrus. So the inferior temporal gyrus, which we saw from the um, lateral view. Then we have an occipital temporal gyrus next to it. So inferior temporal, occipital temporal. The occipital temporal gyrus has a, is separated from your inferior temporal 
temporal gyrus by the occipitotemporal sulcus, which is right here. So occipitotemporal sulcus separates your inferior frontal gyrus, or sorry, inferior temporal gyrus from your occipitotemporal gyrus. Another name for the occipitotemporal gyrus is a fusiform gyrus. And that helps me out because fusiform starts with the letter F. And this gyrus is really responsible for your recognition of faces. So occipitotemporal gyrus associated with your recognition of faces. One more time, occipitotemporal gyrus, known as the fusiform gyrus, is really important for your recognition of faces. Now, I go more medially. Now, this is going to be my parahippocampal gyrus. So the most medial aspect of the temporal lobe from an inferior view is going to be your parahippocampal gyrus. Okay, parahippocampal gyrus located here. The parahippocampal gyrus is separated from your occipitotemporal gyrus by this sulcus right here, which is called the collateral sulcus. So the collateral sulcus is going to separate your occipitotemporal gyrus from your parahippocampal gyrus. Now, a really important structure to know is this little bump off of the parahippocampal gyrus, this little nub. This is called the uncus. And what I want to point out is that the uncus, with where it's located, has the ability to compress vessels and nerves that we're going to see from a different view, and I can tell you specifically what vessels and nerves those are. But there is the possibility, if the brain swells, for the uncus to compress on specific artery and nerves that are going to be really high yield for computer questions. Now going back to a mid-sagittal view, we talked about the anterior region already, so I'm just going to hit on some quick things and then we're going to talk more about the posterior view. So I want to point out the gyrus rectus. One more time, you can see that from a medial view. Again, corpus callosum, a really important structure to identify quickly so that way you can get your orientation down. You have a rostrum, genu, body, and splenium in the back. The paracentral lobule, again, an important structure up here in the front. The paracentral lobule is going to be the medial aspects of your precentral gyrus and your postcentral gyrus. So that's going to be primary motor and primary somatosensory more posteriorly. We talked about the colossal sulcus, which goes right above the corpus callosum, and then the cingulate sulcus, which goes over top of the cingulate gyrus, and it has a marginal branch as it comes up. This gyrus directly behind the marginal branch of the cingulate gyrus and then this other portion of your cingulate sulcus, this is going to be your precuneate gyrus. So this is part of your parietal lobe. So precuneate gyrus, a region of your parietal lobe. So this is the medial aspect of your parietal lobe. One more time, this is your precuneate gyrus. The reason that this is called precuneate gyrus is because more posteriorly, we're going to have the cuneate gyrus. And this is part of your occipital lobe. So I'm marking the borders here of your cuneate gyrus. Now, this sulcus that we're, I'm highlighting at the moment, that is going to divide your parietal lobe from your occipital lobe. This is a continuation of a sulcus that you saw on the lateral sides. So what was the name of the sulcus that separated the parietal lobe and occipital lobe from the lateral view? You got it, the parieto occipital sulcus. And that's going to be the same thing that we see here, parieto occipital sulcus. This sulcus, that separates the cuneate gyrus from the gyrus beneath it is going to be your calcarine sulcus. And I really want to point out this sulcus, the calcarine sulcus, because the calcarine sulcus is going to come up again throughout the course. The calcarine sulcus, along with your cuneate gyrus and regions of your, um, this is going to be your lingual gyrus. These are going to form Brahman's area 17, which is going to be your primary visual cortex. So this is going to be how you see. So occipital lobe is really important in sight and in vision. And then right here along the calcarine sulcus is a really important landmark to know so that way you, for you know for vision. So Brahman area 17 along the calcarine sulcus, which is going to have the cuneate gyrus superiorly and the lingual gyrus inferiorly. Now I want to mark this really quick. Underneath the um, corpus callosum attached via the septum pellucidum, which is this thin substance that we see here, you have the fornix, and the fornix is going to continue posteriorly. You'll talk a lot about the fornix in your fourth exam um, unit, but for now I'm just going to mark it here so that way you know that it is located at the bottom of the septum pellucidum. 
Now, you will need to get really good at knowing um, structures from different views. So this is a coronal view. So we're going to start that every time I get a coronal view, the first thing I look for is do I see the corpus callosum? You should pretty much always see the corpus callosum from one of these views, but it's a really helpful landmark to know because I know if I've found the corpus callosum, I can start identifying other structures based on um, relative positions. So corpus callosum, I go inferior to the corpus callosum, and I see a thin little filmy substance attached to a structure underneath. This is going to be my septum pellucidum. So the septum pellucidum, and we said the septum pellucidum spans between the corpus callosum and an inferior structure, that inferior structure being the fornix. So that's using my context clues to help identify the corpus callosum, septum pellucidum, and fornix. Over here, these large spaces laterally, these are your lateral ventricles. That's going to be more of a focus on your next um, lab unit. So the anterior commissure. The anterior commissure is this white matter um, space here. A commissure is anything that allows communication between two sides of the brain. So this is your anterior commissure. And we'll see this again from a mid-sagittal view in just a moment. But your anterior commissure is a nice landmark to help you tell that you are towards the anterior portion of your brain. So that anterior commissure is a very helpful landmark. Now, that said, we're near, we're near the front of the brain, so we're mostly in the frontal lobe. I've taken a coronal slice, and I see this little bit of white matter. So the white matter here is staying dark. So this white matter tract is actually your olfactory tract. So your olfactory tract is located here. And we said slightly medial to the olfactory tract is where I have my gyrus rectus. So this region of the cortex here is going to be your gyrus rectus. And wouldn't you know, more medial to the gyrus rectus is your medial orbital gyrus. Okay, so using that olfactory tract to help delineate different structures. Right here, you're going to have your optic chiasm, which is where cranial nerve two is going to cross. So optic chiasm here. And because we can't tell if this is anterior or posterior, given us a cross section, we don't know if this is the olfactory, or sorry, optic nerve or optic tract. But there is the crossing over here, which tells me this is the optic chiasm. All right, so this is another view. I just wanted to show you that the other one was a pretty nice, clean view from a textbook, but this is more likely the view that you're going to get when you um, are taking your assessments because this is an actual specimen. But I can still see the same structures and use those to identify. I first start with the corpus callosum. I find the corpus callosum going and communicating between the two separate hemispheres, and I say, okay, the corpus callosum has a septum pellucidum, which communicates down to the fornix. And right here, this is the same view, you see this white matter tract that goes between the two hemispheres. I'm anterior, this is going to tell me this is the anterior commissure with the lateral ventricles on either side. Something that we couldn't see from the prior view because it was a little bit too far superiorly, or the, the cut was too zoomed in. If I go directly above the corpus callosum, there is going to be a gyrus. This gyrus is your cingulate gyrus, okay? Now there's a space between the corpus callosum and the cingulate gyrus, so the space I'm highlighting now. This is going to be your colossal sulcus. Remember that your colossal sulcus is in between your corpus callosum and your cingulate gyrus. The gyrus above the cingulate, I'm sorry, the sulcus above the cingulate gyrus, this is going to be your cingulate sulcus. Okay, your cingulate sulcus is above the cingulate gyrus. All right. Now, going from a more mid-sagittal view, I want to now go into, so we've been doing mostly telencephalon, which is your cerebral hemispheres. We're going to go more into your diencephalon, um, which is going to be your mid, uh, the middle portion of the um, cerebrum here. So we're going to start with your anterior commissure, which we saw in cross-section, where your anterior commissure is located right here at the anterior portion of your diencephalon. All right. So right there. And I, really quick, I'm going to point out the different components of your diencephalon. So your diencephalon is made up of your thalamus, which is this region, your hypothalamus, which is down here. And we'll talk about the borders in just a moment. And then your epithalamus, which is back here. So your different thalami, epi, then the thalamus, and hypothalamus come together to make up your diencephalon. But right here in the front of your um, hypothalamus, that is, you're going to have a white matter tract that communicates between the two sides of the brain. That is your anterior commissure. The, the marker is right on it at the moment. The anterior border of your hypothalamus. This is going to be the lamina terminalis. 
Make sure you know that the laminar terminalis is the anterior border of your hypothalamus or your third ventricle, which is the space that we see here. Now, at the bottom of your hypothalamus, there are a couple of midline structures that you want to point out. The most anterior of which is your optic chiasm. This is where your optic nerve is going to cross over. The little arrow that's pointing to it is your optic recess. So the little arrow that points to it is the optic recess for the optic chiasm. Directly posterior to optic chiasm, this is where we're going to have our infundibular stalk. This is for the pituitary gland. So the infundibular stalk, and then most posteriorly on the bottom of my hypothalamus, is going to be my mammillary bodies. So that is your mammillary body located right there. Now, we said that your thalamus was up here, hypothalamus down here. How do I tell the difference between the two? I look for this little indentation that comes across. This is my hypothalamic sulcus. That is going to help to divide the hypothalamus from the thalamus. So hypothalamic sulcus. Now you see that there's a little hole right here, or it looks like a little indentation. If we were able to zoom in a little bit more, you would see that this is a pretty, it's a foramen, so a hole, and this is going to be the foramen of Monroe. That is going to allow communication from your lateral ventricles, which are deep to the septum pellucidum, to your third ventricle, which is located in this space. So this is going to be an open space to allow CSF to communicate. Now let's see if there's anything else we missed. I think we're doing pretty decent there. I will point out, as we go back into the epithalamus, it's kind of hard to see from a zoomed out view, and um, there's vessels that are covering a lot of this, but right here is where we would expect our pineal gland to be. So our pineal gland should be located somewhere right around in here. And then it's also going to have an arrow pretty much pointing towards it. That would be your pineal recess. Okay, so your pineal gland would be located right around in this region. Um, and then directly below the pineal gland, right here, that's where your posterior commissure would be. And then above the pineal gland, you would have your habenular commissure. And again, we're going to zoom in on this view in just a second, so you'll be able to see that a lot clearer. All right, so I said we're going to zoom in, and here we are. So let's find anterior versus posterior first. So this is the anterior portion of this image, posterior portion back here, inferior, superior. Okay, so here's a little bit of my corpus callosum. This would be my rostrum, and then as it turns the curve, that's my genu. This thin substance is the septum pellucidum. That means that at the bottom of the septum pellucidum, I have my fornix. So this is my fornix here. I told you that right in this region, there's a hole that now that it's zoomed in, we can see is allowing communication between our lateral ventricles and our third ventricle, which is this space. That is going to be your foramen of Monroe. Right here in the front of your hypothalamus, you have a commissure. This is your anterior commissure. This little film right here, this is going to be the anterior surface of your third ventricle. This is going to be your lamina terminalis. The lamina terminalis comes down, a little arrow is pointing down towards your optic chiasm. So this is the optic chiasm. The arrow itself is the optic recess. Right behind it, you have a little stalk. This is your infundibular stalk, which is your pituitary stalk. Okay, and then if I go even further posterior in the hypothalamus, I'm going to have the mammillary bodies. So the mammillary body is what I'm highlighting now. These are all part of your hypothalamus. The hypothalamic sulcus, which separates the hypothalamus from the thalamus, is located right here. So that's the hypothalamic sulcus. So this will be thalamus, this will be hypothalamus. Now, epithalamus back here in the back, what's really nice to see here is we can actually see the pituitary gland. So pituitary gland is a posterior component coming off of your diencephalon. So pituitary gland right here. And the pituitary gland is going to be pushing into a space, which is going to be called your superior cistern, which is all of this space that I'm highlighting. It's full of vasculature and other structures, but the pituitary gland projects into it. Now, right here underneath the pituitary gland, this is the location of your posterior commissure. All right, so you have an anterior commissure, posterior commissure, underneath the pineal gland. Above the pineal gland, up in this region, that's where you would get your habenular commissure. Now, I can't see it clearly because there's a couple of vessels in the way, but it should be located slightly anterior and above the pituitary gland. Or sorry, pineal gland. Pineal gland is located here. Pituitary would be sitting down here. Now, from this view, I also want to point out some of, uh, again, something that will be focused on in the next lab, but your ventricles. So you have your lateral ventricles, which is deep to the septum pellucidum, communicates through the foramen of Monroe. 
you're now in this medial space, which is your third ventricle. I want to communicate down to my fourth ventricle, which is down here. That little pathway is a cerebral aqueduct. So this is a cerebral aqueduct. It's an easy thing that can get clogged, so it's important to know. Directly behind the cerebral aqueduct, this is my tectum. So the tectum sits posteriorly to the cerebral aqueduct above my cerebellum, which is we can't quite see, but is back here. So on the tectum, you're going to have one little bump, two little bumps. These are called colliculi. So you have a superior and an inferior one. So on the tectum, you have a superior colliculus and an inferior colliculus, which we'll talk about as the class progresses. All right, so I think this might be our last uh, slide, but this is a really high yield image to get used to. We're now looking from an inferior view, but we zoomed in. So right here, you have an optic chiasm. So that's where your optic nerve is crossing over into the optic tracts. This little boxer man right here, so there's his head, there's his boxing gloves. This is your infundibular stalk, which would give rise to the pituitary, which would kind of sit in this space. And remember the bone that it sits on, the dorsum cella, right, where the anterior and posterior clonoid process is to protect it. All right, so that's your pituitary gland, infundibular stalk. So if the optic chiasm was most anterior, infundibulum, then next thing we're going to see at the bottom of my hypothalamus is my mammillary body. So I have a mammillary body on both sides. So think back to that mid-sagittal view, which was basically a cut down the middle where we were looking from the sides, and we had the optic chiasm, infundibulum, and the mammillary bodies. Now, you, the, in order to connect the diencephalon to your brainstem, you have these structures that you can't quite see from this view, but they're running up. These are your cerebral peduncles. So cerebral peduncles are located here running up to connect to the brain the brain stem to the um, cerebellum or cerebrum now in between the two is what we call the inter so between inter peduncle cistern a cistern is just a space in the brain so that's where the arrow is pointing now the interpeduncular cistern what i want to point out about the interpeduncular cistern is that there is a nerve that comes out of the interpeduncular cistern this nerve is cranial nerve three this is your oculomotor nerve now, this structure is part of the brain. This is your uncus. So this is the uncus oculomotor nerve. See how close they are together to one another. If the uncus was to swell and compress this nerve, that could cause damage to the oculomotor nerve. Okay, so it's important to know the uncus can compress the oculomotor nerve or one of the two vessels that is on either side of the oculomotor nerve that we don't see here. But the one above would be my posterior cerebral artery and below my superior cerebellar artery. So you remember back to anatomy, you've got your posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar coming out on either side of the um, oculomotor nerve. And the oculomotor nerve, one more time, comes out of the interpeduncular cistern. Now going a little bit more inferiorly, this is my pons. So this is my pons here. And then kind of to the side of the pons, we've got this, um, looks kind of like a paintbrush. This is going to be my trigeminal nerve. So cranial nerve three, cranial nerve five. Come down a little bit more, coming off anterior. There's only one nerve that comes off directly anteriorly in the brain. This is going to be my abducens, cranial nerve six. All right. As I come down, this is now my medulla. So the structure here is my medulla underneath the pons. The medium, medial part of the medulla is going to be my medullary pyramids. So the, the, the medullary pyramid is what I'm highlighting here. You're going to have one on either side. In between, I've got a medullary recess separating the two medullary pyramids. If I go beside the medullary pyramids, lateral on either side, this is going to be the olive. Okay, In, in front of the olive, in between the medullary uh, pyramid and the olive, there is a pre-olivary sulcus. Pre-olivary sulcus. If I could see, again, it's, I can't see here because this is cranial nerve 12 that's blocking the way, but behind the olive is a post-olivary sulcus. So medullary pyramid, pre-olivary sulcus, olive, post-olivary sulcus behind. And one more time, be, remi remind yourself that the uncus can compress the oculomotor nerve and the vessels that are associated there. With that, I think that will bring to a close this particular um, video. Oh, haha, <laughs> spoiler, there's another one. Okay, so kind of going into a mid sagittal view um, real quick, we're going to hit some things really fast. So up here in the front, anterior commissure, optic chiasm, 
infundibular stalk, mammillary bodies. This is all part of my hypothalamus. Separating my hypothalamus from my thalamus is my hypothalamic sulcus. Up here in the front, we have the foramen of Monroe. The anterior portion of my third ventricle is my lamina terminalis. Looking at my corpus callosum, I have the rostrum, genu, or the curve, body, splenium, septum pellucidum connecting the corpus callosum to the inferior located fornix. Right here, you see this little dot? This is on my thalamus. It connects the two thalami to each other. So you have a thalamus on each part of each half of your brain. This is called the interthalamic um, adhesion, which is what we see here. Now, really nice to see here is the tectum with the inferior bump and superior bump. So that's my superior colliculus, inferior colliculus. Could follow that up to find my posterior commissure, going to my pineal gland, and then my habenular commissure will be somewhere around in here. Superior cistern, which is the space in which the pineal gland projects. Third ventricle, followed down to my cerebral aqueduct, to the fourth ventricle, which is what we're going to see here. And with that, that'll bring a close to this video.